Thank you very much. Um, I will try to um, limit my presentation for 10, 15 minutes, although it's going to be kind of difficult. So the title of my presentation is Belarus, a modern dictatorship. Um, some history. So in July, on July the 27th, 1990, the Belarusian Soviet Socialist Republic declared its sovereignty from the Soviet state. In August of 1991, the country was named the Republic of Belarus, and in July 1994, Alexander Lukashenko, a former director of a state-owned collective fund, became the first president of independent Belarus. At that time, no one could foresee that more than 20 years later, uh, the same person would win an overwhelming victory in the fifth presidential election in Belarus. And Dalisa Rice, Secretary of State, once dubbed Belarus the last dictatorship in the center of Europe. And years later, in an interview, Lukashenko said with a hint of irony, I'm the last and only dictator in Europe. Indeed, there are none anywhere else in the world. In my presentation, I'm going to analyze how Lukashenko, who came to power by means of a democratic election, turned into a dictator and brought under his control all three branches of government. I'm also going to offer an explanation of why Belarusian people let this happen and why they have tolerated a dictator for more than 20 years. Finally, I will consider the possible implications of Lukashenko's fifth re-election for Belarus' future development. Um, so I argue that Belarus, modern Belarus, is a dictatorship. But before we can say it, we need to define the concept. So dictatorship can be defined as a rule by a single person or a clique that is not elected through free and fair elections by the subject population and not removable through popular elections, with direct control of a security apparatus that represses political opposition without any independent legislative and judicial checks, and with a high degree of control over the education system, the mass media, the communication and information systems, as well as the movement of citizens toward the goal of continuing monopoly rule by the regime. So if this definition is taken as framework, then Belarus is undoubtedly one. The Belarusian people have been living under an irremovable ruler since 1994, although presidential elections have been conducted in the country with admirable consistency. There are numerous other examples supporting this assertion. Lukashenko's eldest son, Viktor, oversees the national security. Belarusian opposition is extremely marginalized. The Belarusian parliament has never enacted any law on its own. All the judges in the regional and district courts are appointed directly by the president. So how did Lukashenko become a dictator? As a matter of fact, technically, he did not invent the wheel. The wheel. He used the same tools as all modern dictators use when they come to power. First of all, Lukashenko is a civilian dictator and a personalist dictator. Um, personalist dictatorships are not um, in personal dictatorships, not the institutions structure the system and unite elites, but rather the individual politicians. Um, Lukashenko used, as I have already said, the same tools when he came to power uh, to establish dictatorship in our country. The tools included a state or imitation democracy, which is a combination of democratic constitutional forms with the reality of authoritarian rule. Also, they included rigged elections, to new extension, which is an extension of the presidential term of office that happens when an individual president is, for whatever reason, permitted to serve longer than was prescribed at the time of the election into office, and some other things which characterize modern dictatorships. But I think a more important question is, why did Lukashenko become a dictator? Uh, I argue that uh, Lukashenko ensured his rise to power and the subsequent unlimited term in office by making a tacit deal with his people, or by concluding what some political scientists in Belarus define as a peculiar social contract with the Belarusian society, loyalty in exchange for well-being. As I will show further, for many years, the Belarusian president was able to honor his part of the contract, and so was society. In 1994, some macroeconomic indicators uh, in Belarus were as follows. The average annual indices of consumer prices increased 23-fold. The state budget deficit with respect to GDP made up to 3.5%. The negative balance of export and import of commodities and services to GDP achieved 13.2%, and so on. Lukashenko uh, participated in his first election against these deplorable economic indicators. And 
His first agenda, election agenda, was to divert the people from the abyss, by which he apparently understood the economic and political chaos which uh, established itself in the country by 1994, when people were already disenchanted with the ideas of democracy, when the Soviet Union collapsed, when the stores were empty, and people were very unhappy. Um, for many years of Lukashenko being in office, um, he actually managed to honor his part of the contract. Uh, here you can see in this slide some reasons of the economic growth. Uh, among them, you could see favorable external market conditions, for instance, the structure of industry which was inherited from the Soviet Union, from the Soviet past, export-oriented economy of Belarus, well-educated and disciplined labor force, and some other. Uh, then the question is whether society was honoring its part of the contract and um, expressing loyalty to the president. As a matter of fact, uh, it was. So this is how Lukashenko took his steps to dictatorship. Um, let us recall that rulers have some tools at their disposal that help them circumvent terms limit, term limits and prolong their time in office. One of those tools is the introduction of amendments to the Constitution that allow either an additional term or a complete elimination of term limits. A way to introduce a constitutional amendment is to hold a national referendum. So there were three of them um, in Belarus. The first took place in 1995, and the most important outcome of the first referendum was introduction of an amendment to the constitution that allowed the president to terminate the powers of parliament in case it constantly violated the constitution. The next referendum was in 1996, and its most important outcome was adopting changes and additions into the Constitution, which stipulated an increase in the powers of the President, given his decrease the force of law, total control over the state budget, and extension of the presidential term of office until 2001. So the next presidential election occurred only in 2001. But the second referendum was not the last one. This happened in 2004. There was only one question, in that on that referendum, and the most important result of it was complete elimination of the presidential term limits. Um, as I have already mentioned, the uh, president managed to honor his part of the contract and provide the people with uh, an improved standards of well-being. Uh, one of the reasons was what he claimed uh, the establishment of a Belarusian economic model, which is an official name of this model. Uh, this model um, included high effective economy, was supposed to be high effective economy, developed business undertaking and market infrastructure. It was supposed to guarantee high standard of well-being for working society members and social security for those who are disabled or handicapped, and of course constitutional guarantee of rights and freedoms of citizens. However, by 2006, the the Belarusian economic model exhausted its resources. So you can see here some uh, points which justify this assertion. Um, in, under this condition, at some point, President came to realization of the fact that if he wanted to keep his power, he needed to change the contract with the people because he couldn't provide them with um, an improved well-being any longer. So the contract was unilaterally changed. And by this I mean that the president changed his part of the contract. Now it was loyalty in exchange for peace, which became possible after the um, events in Ukraine. And actually about 67% of Belarusians supported annexation of the Crimea. Although you might be surprised that we are not even in Ukraine, we're not Ukrainians, but still people supported it. So in 2015, Lukashenko's um, election agenda already was for the future of independent Belarus. That was his motto. And there were only two paths for Belarus, one of a path of peace and one of war. So the whole program was built around these dichotomies, war, peace, chaos, um, order, um, light, darkness. So the main result of Lukashenko's becoming president for the fifth time would be peaceful and happy life of our people. So if you look at his promises beginning from 1994 until 2015, most of them were concerning 
the economic situation in Belarus and improvement of people's uh, well-being. But by 2015, it was not even on the agenda anymore. Uh, only peace and stability, peaceful and happy life of our people. They were, as if there were no economic problems anymore. So the very last slide. Um, the most important question is whether the people of Belarus accepted the new contract. As a matter of fact, I think they did. The, and the fifth presidential election is a proof of it. Uh, because you can see that 84% voted for Lukashenko again for the fifth time. And it was already on October the 11th, 2015. So some possible implications of the contract change. Peace and stability are more important than what I call chicken and the pot. For how long are people going to be happy with peace and stability instead of um, a good level of well-being? The fact that there, there were no... Uh, mass protest in Minsk after the previous presidential election could be just a lull before the storm. We're not sure if nothing will change. And very important, the price for honoring his part of the contract is getting too high for the president. If you're following what's going on with the job market in Belarus right now or the util housing and utility sector crisis right now. So I think for Lukashenko it should be very important to realize that he cannot honor his part of the contract anymore. And whether the worst case scenario in Maidan is possible in Belarus, when people come to the tipping point in their uh, discontent and dissatisfaction with what is going on right now in the country and in their personal life concerning their well-being. Thank you very much. Thank you, Yulia.